Again, my name is Ben Richard. Um, I'm a librarian at CSU and I'm also one of the uh, members of the planning committee. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Maha Bali. I'm just going to present her talk, Openness for Emergent Shocks. She is joining us from Cairo, Egypt, uh, from her own um, bio. Maha Bali is a professor of practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. She has a PhD in education from the University of Sheffield, United Kingdom. She's a co-founder of virtuallyconnecting.org uh, and a co-facilitator of Equity Unbound. She's also involved in a number of other projects. She writes and speaks frequently about social justice, critical pedagogy, and open and online education. And she blogs regularly at her website, blog.mahabali.me, and tweets at Bali underscore Maha. So if you enjoy Maha's talk, which I have no doubt you will, be sure to read her blog, explore her publications, and get to know the organizations in which she is involved. Um, and I will say that you've been incredibly giving with your time. Uh, I know you're an in-demand speaker and it feels like a real privilege to have you with us today. Um, Cairo is seven hours ahead of us and um, we've learned recently that you have a wedding right after this talk that you're gonna go to. Um, so I'm really excited to hear you um, and I'm gonna let you take over now. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Thank you for inviting me and thank you all for being here today. Um, I, I just put the link to my slides in the chat. I'm going to put it again. And there's a lot of links I might be putting throughout uh, the session. Um, expect this to be an interactive session. It's never about what I have to say. It's about the kind of conversation we can have together. So please use the chat whenever you like. But I will also invite you a lot of times to do that. And it's going to be a better keynote for what you contribute to it as well. Uh, and so when I put links in the chat, if you think they'll be useful beyond the session, you could also put them in Discord if you like. It's going to be difficult for me to do that, but I'll put them in the chat. And then if anyone wants to put them in Discord, that'll be good. Um, all right. So this title is about a lot of ideas I've got in my mind. So openness for emergent shocks. And I always like to start by saying, assalamu alaikum. It just means peace be upon you. And it works for morning, nights, whatever time zone you're in. And it also works for high and by. And I always want to ask, how are you feeling today? I started this practice during the pandemic because I realized people were always feeling differently every moment of every day. And I still think we're in that space where it's a roller coaster of emotions. So tell me how you're feeling in the chat. How are you feeling today? You can be feeling more than one thing too. Because sometimes you like something, it's like one word and just one feeling. You can have more than one feeling. I'm seeing excited and grateful, tired, excited to hear. Good, good day, excited. Happy semester is over. Mine isn't over yet. It'll be over soon. Glad it's Friday. Grateful for a lovely day. Feeling ready for the weekend. Sunny, relaxed. Friday is weekend here, by the way. So it's I'm in my weekend. Overwhelmed, tired, very weary, excited, tired, tired, but excited, curious. Thank you. I'm feeling ready for a weekend. Rough week. Enjoying beautiful weather. I'm glad you have beautiful weather today. Having a good day. Relaxed. Ready for a break. All right. Grateful. Remote work Friday. Good for you. Our university stopped the remote work for staff. So curious. Grateful. I can say I'm great on Friday. Relaxed. Happy. A little anxious getting ready for a busy week and a big trip. That's me. Like I'm getting ready for a busy week and a big trip too. So I'm I'm really anxious about the about that trip. And so the way I deal with that is I just bake a lot. So, <laughs> so everyone's benefiting from my anxiety. So so here's the link to my slides. They're open for commenting. They're Creative Commons license. You can use them. You can post them on Twitter as long as you attribute me. You can reuse parts of them as long as you attribute me as well. Just don't sell them. Um, and they're open for commenting. So after this keynote is over, if you want to go back to something and you want to look at it again, you want to keep talking to me about it, people do that sometimes, and I'm very happy to, to keep talking about it. And sort of what to expect today, we just did the checking in of seeing how you're feeling. We'll do some chatterfall where I ask uh, some questions and somebody's annotating. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if you want to, I can remove that, but you know, I'm oops, clearing that. Okay. I'm um, going to introduce the equity care matrix and sort of make sure we're all on the same foundation of an expansive definition of what openness is. And we'll talk about openness for shocks, which build on the work of Adrienne Marie Brown, Emergent Strategy. And I'll talk you through something called EcoCycle, if you've never seen it before, as a way to think through this. And 
I want to hear your takeaways as well. Sometimes I speed up and slow down certain parts of the keynote, depending on how people respond. So if we don't cover everything, that's okay. The conversation is more important and you'll have the slides. So don't worry about anything that I skip over or go, go over too fast. Um, because I'm not in the US, I'm we don't do land acknowledgements over here. But I do want to acknowledge this because my work centers around social justice. I think it's still important to acknowledge something. Um, and I want to say that coloniality survives colonialism. It's maintained alive in books, the criteria for academic performance, cultural patterns, common sense, and the self-image of peoples and aspirations of self and so many other aspects of our modern experience. And in a way, as modern subjects, we breathe coloniality all the time and every day. And in education and in higher education, academia especially, this is very, very strong. Here I am right here talking to you in English, which is not my first language, even though, or not my native language, actually, but I'm very fluent in it. And it gives me power to speak this way, but it's, it's still not my language or my culture. And I do this, and this is what empowers me to be able to communicate with you all, but it's another uh, manifestation of colonialism, right? And I just want to acknowledge that a lot of what I'm talking about today, a lot of times I get invited to give a lot of keynotes. Uh, but I'm always inspired by people I collaborate with and I co-author with, and I just get invited to keynote much more than them. So I just want you to know all these people. So Anna Mills, who's led a lot of work on AI, Lance Eaton, who leads a lot of work on educational technology and critical approaches, Daniela Gashago and Nicola Pallet from South Africa, who do a lot of great work in education and educational technology, Yasser Temer, who is a former student of mine and a disability advocate, and Anuj Gupta, who I just met online recently. And Thinking through my work with these people has inspired the kinds of ideas that I'm sharing with you today. So in Chatterfall, I'm gonna ask a question and hope that you will tell me in the chat, what energizes you these days? Let me know in the chat. Radical rest. Oh, I wanna know what that looks like. What's radical rest for you? I'm so interested in that. Student success, working in soil in my garden. Me too. I don't have a, an actual garden that's mine, but we have a little plot at, at work that I work on and I plant stuff. Students and chat GPT, snuggles with your one-year-old, oh, rock hounding, time with family, walking, running, research, walking in the park, collaboration with colleagues, walking dogs. Knowing that you're helping students succeed by fighting OER and free legal materials, talking with colleagues, yoga, being with friends, making beautiful things. I wonder what those beautiful things they are. Being outside, definitely for me as well, when the weather's good. My puppy Winston, aw, open pedagogy, being with friends, meaningful connection, hiking in the woods, making from website design to crafting. So making in general, right? Working with students, music, working with musical creations, completing new ideas outside the box, discovering possible solutions, creative outlets, holiday. All right, that's good. Morning meditation exercise, finding new creative ways to present stories, information, and waking up super early. Those are nice. I like waking up early too before everyone else does. <laughs> when it works. Teaching African American literature from the perspective of a Black feminist, Black womanism. Nice, Adrian. Okay, so. And. Oh, thank you. So someone sent me a private note. Thank you for that. Very nice. I, I wish you had sent that one publicly. If you meant to send it publicly and you sent it as a direct message by mistake, go ahead and send that publicly. Um, all right, so this next question is, what was a recent shock in your context lately? Uh, and so by shock, you know, I mean something. So in, in the literature I'm going to refer to later, a shock is like a very big disaster, like uh, something like an earthquake or something like that, that really is a shock to the system of the environment, but it can also be a shock to the education system. And I think you can imagine which ones we've had recently, but I'm curious if you've had different ones, you know, some institutions might have had, like there are some that I think we've felt globally, but others. So the possible passing and signing of Senate Bill 83 in Ohio, I have no idea what that is, but if you'd like to clarify, I'm sure everyone else knows what it is except me. <laughs> Anti-trans legislation in Idaho, you have two trans, I'm so sorry, that's horrible to experience that and to live through that. Textbooks on back order, upheaval in personal life, boss leaving another leadership, yeah, others are saying about 83, new job, new culture, university merging with a local college. Yeah, Chad GPT is the one most people in my institution would say for this year, obviously COVID three years ago. Uh, reading about, has it been three years? Can you imagine? It's been three years. Black Lives smile about end of essential resources that humans require. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> ALP shift for co-rec model. I have no idea what that is. Enrollment, new job relocation. 
the intellectual diversity. So is it an anti-racism, uh, anti-critical race theory type of law? Resignation of an administrator who I really liked. Yeah, that can be really bad. I've got that happening as well. Someone retiring who's my mentor. That's, yeah, you made me just realize, yeah, that's a shock to my system. It's affecting me as well. Threats to free and true in the classroom and lack of pathway fair wages for your labor. April, yeah. Go planning a big wedding coming up on your own son. That's going to be a shock to the system for sure. The leaving home stuff. So SB 83 will punish institutions that provide DAI training by taking away funding. Okay, yeah. So I'm getting the idea now. That is always really, it's horrible when we hear this kind of news coming from a country that we think is educated and developed and, and all the, the ways we hope it would be. I'm very sorry this is happening in your country. Uh, what is something valuable you learned from the open recently? So something that you didn't learn from people around you in your institution and not from something you paid for, I guess. So what's something you learned from the open recently that was really valuable? Oh, this is taking a while. People are thinking through this. Um, for me, a lot of what I've learned about what's happening with ChatGPT and artificial intelligence in general is stuff I've learned from what people, there we go. Shelly's talking about AI and ChatGPT as a tool for neurodivergent students. Thank you for that angle on it, Shelly. Thank you very much. Anna Mill's suggestions on classroom teaching with ChatGPT. Yeah, Anna has done awesome work crowdsourcing and sharing her own thinking and her own experimentation with this. Better ways to search the database PubMed. Oh. That's interesting. I, I'm interested. My husband's a doctor. I'd like to know more about this, Jen. Uh, we had someone share a link to a directory for OER that she's remixing. Okay, that's cool. Because that's that's a big deal, right? Finding a good directory for OER that helps you find stuff as well. Collective action in the world of podcast writers and how AI is affecting different industries. Yes, white students want to be part of multiculturalism. Using R for statistical programming. Yeah. Continuing to find lots of open data sources for student marketing projects. Oh, that's cool. Insights about OER and open pedagogy. OER colleagues sharing how to do peer review and pre-publication checks. Nice. Just shared on a new Revis Press book, Making Ripples. Really enjoying it so far. Oh, you just started on that one? Okay, cool. Put the link in, Amanda. If anybody wants to put the link for the stuff that they're talking about, maybe other people could benefit from that, although I guess we could always search for it. Digital Commons Network. Okay, I don't, I don't know that one. Excellent tours for studying languages. That's cool. If you want to post some specific ones. Is Making Ripples about like, causing um, institutional change. I hope that's what it is. Like disrupting the system. That's what I'm guessing it is. I don't know who wrote it though. Okay. All right, and what is an unexpected thing that brought you peace or joy recently? Thank you. Thank you to those who posted links. I actually got interested in this one. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the slideshow. What's something that caused you unexpected, unexpected thing that brought peace or joy? Dog finally enjoys his crate. Okay, my kid, <laughs> okay, thank you. Lilacs blooming, I love flowers. I'm so happy, I'm so happy for your lilacs, I love lilacs. Visits with family, better ways to search the database as well. Okay, that, that's a really big one, okay. Oh, that's cool. The podcast episode. Right. Okay. Thanks for that. I'll share that with my husband. Husband planning summer vacation. Husband never plans summer vacation. So I would be happy if he did one day. Um, my son created his own storybook. Wow. First grade. That's amazing. Your son's last band concert. Yeah, that's beautiful. Good news from friends. Buyout. Spring weather. Choir concert. Support of colleagues during stress time. Warm weather. Kids choir concert at school. It was a show. Ted Lasso. Okay, that's a TV show, right? My daughter's choir con I need to watch that. I've never watched it. Uh, bought myself celebration flowers, peonies. Yeah. Yeah. I've gotten flowers for myself before too. Being part of CSU's new Africana studies department, almost three year old. And if you know, if you like flowers, I take pictures and post them on Instagram all the time. <laughs> My almost three year old picking up sound design system terms from playing music with him. Wow, that's amazing. Being a raised garden beds and buying strawberry plants and publication. Congratulations, patients. Uh, photo archives of my deceased parents and computer files of my dad's writing brought his essence alive. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. 
receiving fresh flowers. So lots of flower lovers today. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, so I'm very um, influenced by the book Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. If you've never read it, it's a really interesting book. You may find it on the internet archive for free, I think, um, but you can also buy it um, on Kindle or a hard copy. So she talks about how new normal of instability falls into two groups, shocks and slides. So shocks present themselves as acute moments of disruption. These are, for example, market crashes, huge disasters, and uprisings, if we talk about them in the social sense. And slides, on the other hand, are incremental by nature. They can be catastrophic, but they're not experienced as acute. I would say COVID was a shock and remote learning was a shock, the pivot. But then going back to face-to-face -to -face was a bit more gradual, and things like hybrid learning and so on were slower in nature. And she says one of our key roles as social movements must be to harness the shocks and direct the slides, all towards achieving the systemic, cultural, and psychic shifts we need to navigate the changes with the greatest equity, resilience, and ecological restoration possible. She's not talking about education, but we're applying this to education, right? And so she says, she uses this term intentional adaptation, and she says that it's at the heart of emergent strategy, how we live and grow and stay purposeful in the face of constant change actually does determine both the quality of our own lives and the impact that we can have when we move into action together. And I, I don't know what it was like at your institutions, but for, for me, it was really important for me when COVID happened to center equity and care in our response to this and equity and care at all the levels, you know, for the students and for the faculty and for the support folks who are helping them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this as we go forward. Another thing that Adrienne Marie Brown talks about that I think is really relevant when we're talking about openness is this one. Building community is to the collective as spiritual practice is to the individual. I love this quote because I think a lot of times, and uh, we'll talk about this now, a lot of times we talk about openness in terms of the artifacts, but I think for me, the communities around openness, and I could see this from some of what you guys wrote so far, that the communities around openness themselves are sometimes the thing that's really bringing us um, a lot of joy, but also helping us grow. And so when I talk about openness and open education, I follow sort of what Catherine Cronin talks about in terms of openness being contextual, personal, and continually negotiated. So it's not one thing for all of us, and it's more than one thing, and it has a lot of dimensions. Um, and I, I, all, I think I'm influenced by this. An Egyptian educator and author called Tahsin used to say, knowledge is like water and air. So in Arabic, that's al-ilm kalmet wal hawa. And this is a long time ago that he said this, like, I don't know what year, but like a very long time ago. Um, and so, you know, in what ways is open education like water or should be like water? What do you guys think? Tell me in the chat. Refreshing, gives life, always moving, fluid, available to everyone, fills spaces, free. The rock and the river. I don't know what Lao Tzu is saying about the rock and the river. Leaves a trace, it flows, continually redefined, flexible, adaptable, versatile, persistent, finds its way into places not naturally there, ever changing, never static. If it's static, it stinks. I like that, Rebecca. Ideally, easy, accessible. Ideally, right? Not always, though, right? Not always free, not always available. Like all the things that we're saying, that's not always the case with water, but it's how we imagine water should be and hopefully education should be. Gives life and necessary for growth. Yes. Thank you, Benjamin. Shapes people over time like water shapes rock. Being flexible must flow. Okay. Thank you, Donna. Can flow in any direction. Many forms. Powerful brings significant change over periods of time. Everyone can learn. Ripples, far reaching. Yes. Reflect society. I like that. No one's ever said that one. Reflect society. Uh, essential. I love all of them. Um, I also want to say uh, something else about, oh, okay, someone else wrote something. You can't teach a person to read, then tell them how to think. Knowledge will seek its own level. I like that. Everyone needs it. Yes, true about that, about water. So Suzanne Kosioglu and I, in 2016, wrote about the self as OER. So the self as an open educational resource. And part of that is an attitude. Openness is an attitude or worldview beyond technical definitions, such as open access and such. Characteristics of open selves would be things like being an editable person. So inward openness for change based on interaction with others, narrating our practices, sharing our processes, making ourselves vulnerable, negotiation of knowledge and not just polished products. And these are not easy things to do. We, we acknowledge that, right? 
Um, and we also, after we wrote that and presented it, we thought maybe remove it to make it open self rather than OER and focus also on connection and community, which I mentioned earlier aspects, you know, not just the self and identity as separate from social aspects, right? Other work I've done on openness is to categorize open educational practices. So defining open educational practices more broadly, sort of as anything that is related to education and happens in the open. So it may be related to production or creation or manipulation of open educational resources, but a lot of it can happen in other spaces, like just on social media or blogs or things like that. And as I give examples of this, um, if you're not familiar with all the things I'm gonna say, you'll get more familiar with it. Oh, open educational practices may be content centric if they're all about producing an open textbook, for example, but they may be process centric and all about the interaction between people or about annotating or reading together, but not about the reading itself, more about the interaction between people. It can also be teacher centric or learner centric. Is it the teacher that's creating an OER or using an OER or are learners themselves creating an OER or are learners themselves interacting with other people in the open, right? And it can be done for pedagogical purposes or for social justice purposes. So sometimes we're doing an open project and giving students their own uh, blogs to create their own uh, whatever because we want to give students agency because it's good for learning. And sometimes we do it because we want to center social justice. And it's okay to go anywhere across the spectrum. It's just to recognize that there's a variety and that it's multidimensional, right? And pedagogical stuff can have cognitive benefits, but can have skills and it can be effective, right? And social justice, a lot of times we focus on just the economic social justice of providing something for free, but there are other elements of uh, social justice that some of you have mentioned related to culture and politics. Uh, you know, and I'll talk about these in a second. And the other thing is that even when we do something for social justice, we need to recognize whether what we've done is actually transformative or is it just ameliorative and just fixing a problem? And to recognize that for some groups, something might be transformative for some, but also neutral or negative for others. So it's not always one thing that's gonna work for all social groups. Sometimes when you try to focus on one social group, you may oppress another or be neutral for another. So this is the definition of openness that I like, and there are so many of them, but I just, this is the broadest, I think, in terms of its, its um, what it covers, you know? A broad descriptor of anything that includes creation, use, and reuse of OER, as well as open pedagogies and open sharing of teaching practices, right? Um, so talking about social justice in a little bit more detail here, there's the economic aspect, which I think most people think about right away. So giving access to those who do not otherwise have access, but you don't change the actual learning experience, you're just redistributing it. But cultural injustice, you want to deal with that by giving those who do not otherwise have access to the learning experience while also redesigning it with minorities in mind. So re recognizing and reacculturating, making sure your textbooks, for example, include um, examples from different cultures and from different colors and marginalized groups, right? And then there's political injustice. And it's not just about giving access, but it's more about those normally without access to the redesign, to the design of something. So emphasizing equitable representation. And this is what Nancy Fraser calls parity of participation. So when they come to the table, you don't bring them to a table that's already pre-designed and tell them, design it, but this is all you've got. Allow them and give them the space to decide how they want to participate and how they want the table to, all right? Um, and then the equity care matrix, which Mia Zamora and I first presented at the Open Ed Conference in 2020 and later published. I am going to put the link to that here. All right, so I hope that link works. Um, basically, we asked on Twitter, but I'll, I'll show you this quote first. Is, we were inspired by Bell Hooks saying that teachers who care, who serve their students, are usually at odds with the environments wherein we teach. And I think this will resonate with a lot of people. Uh, I, can't, I can't actually use this quote inside my own institution, but I use it everywhere else. <laughs> so what is equity without care and what is care without equity is what we asked on Twitter. And we got a lot of responses from people that we ended up making into these quadrants of, you know, what's care without equity, what's care, equity without care? Equity without care is sometimes tokenism or diversity theater or lip service or systemic or it's performance. And in Arabic, we say the word riyat, where you do something to look good, but you don't really mean it, right? And care without equity, people said selective, effective labor, ameliorative is like a Band-Aid. Um, and of course, care without, no care, no equity, that's probably systemic injustice. And care with equity, we started to think, oh, who does that? You know, is that justice? Is it parity of participation as Nancy Fraser says it? Is it intentionally equitable hospitality, which is something that we co-developed? What is it? And so when we were writing the paper, 
we had, they, the, the reviewers asked us to name each quadrant. So we're calling care without like, equity without care contractual equity. You write it down, but the people who are doing it don't really care about it. Like you have a diversity policy, but the people who implement it don't really care when they're doing it. Or the other people, like the, everyone else, is just following the letter of it, but not the heart. And care without equity, we're calling partial care. This means that some people care and some people don't. So there's a burden of care on some people and not others. This also means that some people receive care and not others. And it's also partial in the sense of being biased because not everyone sees everything that needs care. And what we want is equity with care, which we're calling socially just care, and which I think open education helps a lot with because sometimes the kind of care you need isn't available within your institution and openness allows you to, to open up to that. Um, I love this quote from the pirate care syllabus, you know, care labor holds the capacity to disobey power and increase our collective freedom. This is why when it's organized in a capitalist, patriarchal and racist, racist ways, it does not work for most living beings. We're in a global crisis of care. I also love this uh, diagram from Jernovich and Carvalho to just let us notice all the kinds of equity issues that we have to consider when we're talking about open distance and digital education. Um, and I, I want to talk about, you know, inequality in society as a, at large affects us, digital inequities affect us, datafication affects us, changing forms of teaching and learning provision and how they affect us, right? And this post-digital society where we're not, we don't even know where the digital begins and ends and everything, right? So what open practices supported you during the pandemic period? And let me know in the chat while I present a few things here. So for me, um, a group of us started a continuity with CareThread. We crowdsourced how we're going to move online with care. And we also started a Twitter DM, like just to start deciding to do a session on Zoom that we live stream. But then in the end, we kept going. We're still going for three years now. We actually moved to Signal because a lot of people didn't want to use Twitter anymore. But there's that. So much freedom for professional development for sure. So people who had never done professional development online, now everybody is doing professional development online. A lot of it was free when before everything, a lot of, well, there was a, a little bit of free stuff before, but there was so much more free stuff during the pandemic. Community at Cleveland Teaching Collaborative, great. I'm so happy to hear that you had something like that. Because sometimes there's a local situation that is a virtual happy hour with colleagues. Yeah, we used to have coffee sessions, morning coffees and things like that. Yeah. So one of the things um, that we also co-developed, me as Amora, Adam Keynes and I, and with a lot of educators from all over the world, we developed resources to help people figure out how do we move online with care? How do we uh, build community online? Because what happened was there was a lot of people who'd never taught online before and they suddenly were gonna have to teach online in September, 2020. And they didn't think that they could build community online. We kept hearing that. And so we created this resource. I don't know if any of you have seen it before. Um, and anyway, it's taken a while to open. It's okay, we don't have to open it. Um, we recorded videos of ourselves trying out different activities that we would normally do face-to-face -face and how they would work online. Uh, we had a lot of educators from all over the world contribute theirs and we would act like students and interact with the activity. So you can imagine how it might work. And we didn't just, put the activity and say, okay, here's the way to do it. We also had like, okay, so what if you don't have Zoom and breakout rooms? Here's how you could do it. What if your students are asynchronous? What if they don't open the cameras? And we kept asking, like everybody had a different context. How might you benefit from that? And so we kept growing this and we still have, we have activities for introductions, for warming up at the beginning of class, for ongoing collaboration, for reflection, for setting the tone with your students. And so I'm just gonna give a few examples of the things we did. So one is annotating the syllabus, which with, I had a conversation with Rainy Collier around that and surveying your students before you meet them in the middle of the semester, at the end of class and things like that to get their feedback and get to know them better. Using third places outside of class meeting times. And that's for me, one of the best uses of open using Discord or Slack or WhatsApp or something for students to stay in touch with each other and not just with you, right? In between class meeting times and we're gonna have less formal discussions and ask quick questions and ask for support. Um, and checking in and warming up regularly. So if you've never tried these, Wilder, Matty, and Spiral Journal are great liberating structures and development to help people get to know each other and just get them energized for class or to help them slow down and cool down at the end of class. Whoops, did not mean to click that either. Um, and we talk in my class and we have several ways of doing this, but talking about uh, and practicing trauma-informed pedagogy and their videos by Maisa Ahmed and, uh, and the resource by Karen Costa on the site. 
gratitude journaling as something that helped my students' well-being. And I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily directly connected to your class, but talking to your students about these things that can help their well-being helps. Um, I did Troika Consulting. This is a liberating structure. If you've never heard of this, this is a way for students to work in threes and support each other so that they're not just uh, asking teachers or adults for help. Sometimes they can ask each other. For, I mean, it depends on the age of your students, but you know what I mean. They can support each other. They don't necessarily need their professor for everything. And that helps build community between them as well. And then TRIZ is a playful way of problem solving that can help students open up about things that normally they wouldn't talk about. Helps with meetings also with anyone really. Uh, again, if you've never done that, that's uh, a really good one to try. And this is, oh, it's always, you know, and there's always an invitation to contribute to the site. So don't just uh, take what's there. But if you do something innovative or interesting in, in what you teach and you're willing to share with other people, go ahead and fill that form and someone will get in touch with you to, to publish it. And we've had a few of those. Um, another thing that I don't know if any of you know about MyFest. So MyFest was something we did last year for three months. We thought, you know what? Conferences, like we were at the stage where people were going back face to face and conferences that were online were still like two, three days and lots of sessions in parallel. And it was fat Zoom fatigue and decision fatigue and we still had face to face lives. So we said, you know what, we're not going to do that. We're going to do a three month learning experience. So we still haven't posted the new stuff for 2023, but 2022, you can find out more at this site. Uh, we're going to do one, inshallah, starting June again, where you can choose what you want to do. There are no parallel sessions. There are like two or three sessions a week. And so you build community over three months and it becomes not just uh, a, a one day or three day conference, but like a three month learning journey um, in and out whenever you like, choose your own path, come to whatever you're interested in type of thing. So we're going to do another one of those. That was a shock in the sense, this was not a shock, this was a slide, right? This was, things were slowing down, but we still needed something and we needed more community and joy and caring than very formal types of learning. So this kind of worked out. They had a lot of discussion sessions and sessions about healing and, and uh, trauma and joy and also social justice and open education. We had an entire track for open education. And then what about AI? What are some ways in which openness has helped you or your institution respond to the impact of AI? like ChatGPT on education. That was one that we talked about as a shock, right, this semester? Oh, thank you, Diana. Yes, faculty learning community. I lead a faculty learning community as well. It lasts for a year and I, I love it as well. Yeah, that's really good to hear, Adrienne. So it helped you back being a student. It was reaffirming, helpful, if not healing for me as a change agent. Thank you for sharing that. It was focused on critical thinking, that's cool. I do one for a new faculty. But I'd love to have several different ones for different with different focus areas for sure. I'm gonna go on about the AI. Um, I think there's no one size fits all response to AI. Um, we all have different contexts and different goals and different challenges and equalities within the same institution even. And sometimes it's actually easier to connect with someone who's in another institution who teaches something similar you're optimistic, but also concerned. Yeah. What about how has openness helped you through this? Though? That's my question. Have you done things in the open? I mean, people mentioned already what Anna Mills shared. That definitely helped, I think, everyone. Um, so one of the things that I did recently was give cake as a metaphor for AI, cake making. As a, you can tell, I'm into baking. So, you know, when would you make a cake from scratch? When would you make it from a box, bakery, or grocery? And I asked that question on Twitter. And the kinds of responses I got to this helped me a lot with my thinking through it. So, you know, people talked about, you know, when is it important to do something from scratch, like right from scratch, right? And how to motivate someone to, and a lot of people talked about, well, if what I'm teaching is how to bake cakes, right? Yeah, I, me too, Lisa. Like when, when AI started to become an issue, was it around the same time that Elon Musk bought Twitter and people were trying to leave? But I stayed because the AI thing, it was really helpful. It was very difficult to keep making connections like on Mastodon or LinkedIn or I, mean, I still did, but not, not, yeah, not at the scale of Twitter for sure. It helped me a lot with AI. A lot of faculty conversations around how to integrate into teaching classroom rather than try and shut it out entirely. Yeah, we've been having those as well. I mean, it's impossible to shut it out really, so. Um, and then the other idea is like, when is it okay to get it homemade, but from a box, when would you need that? 
when is it okay? So people were responding to that. Yeah, like sometimes the goal is to decorate the cake. So it's okay to get it from a box and just focus on decorating, right? When is it okay to buy it from a store, but it's still made by another human? I guess this is more like using, asking a friend to write the paper for you or, or uh, contract cheating or something. And then there's the idea of like getting a Twinkie or something when you buy something from a grocery store and they all look the same. And sometimes when students use AI in a very bad way and just present a whole thing as their assignment, it looks like a Twinkie. It's very blah, you know, nothing special. They all look similar. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar. So it's it's like how you know how do we treat AI? That way? But open practices that I felt supported us. I think the key thing with AI and with COVID is with remote learning, the shock of remote learning, the shock of ChatGPT, is that nobody really knew what to do. There it didn't matter how much you knew about AI before ChatGPT. I knew a lot about AI and I taught about AI. I I did my undergraduate thesis twenty years ago using machine learning, and that did not prepare me for this. Um, and the same with the remote learning. I had been an expert in e-learning for about 18 years by the time COVID happened, but it was a completely different situation because everyone was forced into this situation where everyone had to teach online, everyone had to learn online. Nobody had planned it. Nobody had time to design courses the way we used to spend six months designing courses thoughtfully for online, you know? So I think with, with AI, also nobody really knew what was going to happen because it wasn't just people who chose to use it. It was like all over the place, right? And for me, one of the most important things about openness is sharing incomplete thoughts on a place like Twitter or Mastodon or blogs, um, discussing things, you know, and, and something like the AI and education mailing list has been really helpful as well. So these were people who are all focused on wanting to talk about AI and education. Uh, there are a lot of open workshops and webinars uh, at Equity Unbound. Anna Mills and I offered a couple of those. The crowdsourcing of resources like Anna Mills has done. Uh, the crowdsourcing of policies like Lance Eden has done. If you haven't seen that, that was really, really helpful at the beginning of the semester. And there was the, this project of quite crowdsourcing creative uses of AI in education. If you haven't seen that, I'll put the link to it here. It's quite cool. Uh, I think it's closed access now, but you can request access if you wanted to add something to it. So Elle is saying, uh, AI can create more learning opportunities for centering disability justice. A lot of accessibility software is or will be built on AI frameworks. However, we need to also be aware of the opportunity cost of letting automation do our writing and thinking for us. Yeah, my daughter actually, because I have uh, I, I have a blind friend who was my student at some point, and she gets to talk to him a lot. So in her school, she had to imagine a product and she imagined something that um, was a disability justice type of thing. Like it was an accessibility tool that would help with reading stuff that isn't written in Braille, but isn't screen readable. It was a very interesting project that she came up with with that. But yeah, I can imagine AI doing a lot of that. I was also with someone who works on, um, I think he was saying, he was talking about a lot of the accessibility and obviously uses a lot of AI to be able to do that, I agree. And a lot of the AI uses outside of things like writing are really, really good. It's just the ones for writing may be problematic for education to an extent, that's all. Uh, the challenge of helping students and faculty effectively use AI in research and writing may be similar to when we did the same with databases. Yeah, yeah, and shifting also from databases. Like, I remember catalogs in libraries and then databases and then Google Scholar and where we're at today. I think those things are a uh, big shift, right? big shocks to the system will take a while. And they still have, there are risks that come with these. Every kind of openness that we do, there are risks that'll come with them. I'll say a couple of them, but let me know if you see other risks as well. Uh, but always one of the good things about open is they can keep revising, right? That's the important thing. So this was one of the questions. I, I don't know if you guys saw this one where there was a famous um, uh, influencer who they, she allowed people to create a bot from videos of her so that you can actually talk to her from through the bot, like not her really. You guys seen that one? So I, I thought I saw that. And then I think someone said something about, oh, well, actually, uh, you know, you could take videos of a professor who's done a lot of lectures and he's dead now, but then you can create videos and have students ask him questions. And I started to feel really uncomfortable with that. Um, yeah, this is wild. I'm very uncomfortable. I, I read a story a long time ago called Goodbye for Now, where uh, after someone, after a loved one died, they could recreate them from their former Skype videos, well, Skype, you know, back then that you were using Skype. Skype videos, and then you could talk to them, and that's just really disturbing. And so I was starting to think, you know, if I have videos with CC BY on them on YouTube, this actually, does this actually mean that it's okay? 
for an AI bot to train and then behave and sound like me. And I wasn't, I'm not comfortable with this. So if you wanted to take a look at this conversation we've been having on Twitter, um, oh, the link, I can't get, for some reason, the link isn't working for me right now. Oh, here it is. Jump into this conversation. We haven't reached anything yet. There's a Black Mirror episode on that too, I bet. Black Mirror knows everything. <laughs> So, but we're very close to this, actually. I mean, we knew it was happening with deep fakes, but if it happens, you know, uh, you know, with deep fakes, you think, oh, very famous people, they're going to do that. But now, even if you have, I have, a, there are a lot of videos of me online, you know, so I'm not comfortable with that. Um, and then I got blocked twice on Twitter for things I said. One of them, I was trying to learn something about disability justice, but the person, for some reason, got really upset with me and blocked me. And I was upset because I thought she was my friend. And then another person whose opinion I don't care about didn't like me because I was trying to say that uh, AI can't replace teachers or something. That seems really obvious to me that he didn't agree with, but it's okay. <laughs> so that can happen, right? When you post incomplete thoughts, you're still thinking through something, you can get misunderstood or you can be understood, but people don't appreciate like you sharing these incomplete thoughts. So we make ourselves vulnerable by doing that. Um, I've been mildly abused by proctoring companies before but i haven't been sued by them we know in in link letter has been sued by proctorio uh i've been harassed by the ceo of proctorio but because i have a lot of friends on twitter a lot of people defended me including tracy mcmillan cotton and sava Haley singh and a lot of people so i i'm kind of lucky that way but uh it's not easy i'm not saying it's easy to go out there and, and put yourself out there and ask questions and say things when you're not really there um i've seen people who are really really experts in what they say, especially women who get mansplained all the time on Twitter by people thinking when they're asking a question that they really don't have an answer. They're actually asking to provoke conversation and to, to have a conversation, not to actually say, I have no idea, please teach me, you know? So I've seen that happen a lot. I think, I think there's worse that can happen as well, but these are just a couple of things. But I worry that people will share less because of those fears, you know, of what's going to happen to the material I share. Like some people say, oh, so everything I've shared openly, now people are going to use them to train AI. And we have no idea what they're using for data sets half the time. Sometimes they tell us, but this time we don't know everything that they're using to, to train the AI. So, and it's gonna look indistinguishable if it's not someone's video, so. All right, so we have uh, a little bit more than 15 minutes. Um, and I wanna share with you eco-cycle planning, which is one of my favorite liberating structures. It's built on work on complexity science and agriculture. So again, also because I'm doing some planting these days, I'm, I love this metaphor. Um, I, if you've never heard of it, I'm just gonna describe it really quickly. The idea of it is, is simple, but I like the diagram of looking at a life cycle of something. And to think about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the annotation just to point to things. So it's a bit easier to know what I'm talking about. So if you look at, the sum total of everything you do in your department or in your job, things that are in a stage of maturity, like what you're doing is working for you, you're harvesting regularly, you just need someone to manage things and everything will go normally. But every now and then a shock happens to the system or a slide, like something's changing, right? And you find yourself in a rigidity trap where something is no longer helping you meet your goals, but you're just so used to doing it and you don't stop. And sometimes you actually need to creatively destroy this thing. And that's a bit of a heretic move in order to renew, to make space for new ideas. And so the new ideas are usually in gestation, like you know you have a good idea, but you're actually in a poverty trap. You don't have resources to actually make that idea happen. I'm sure all of us have this, like we've had some ideas going on for a couple of years, but we haven't been able to implement them. So because we're in a poverty trap, that's why you need to destroy some things to free up resources for renewal, to get out of this poverty trap and get into birth. You try something new, and that will need an entrepreneurial person to lead, to tend this new thing until it grows enough to be mature. So one example of that is during COVID, suddenly you had to give, in my department, I'm an educational developer, right? So we give workshops to faculty and we were giving face-to-face -face workshops most of the time. And now suddenly, oh, now we have to give online workshops because the face-to-face -face workshops, they're not working for us anymore. We can't meet face-to-face. -face. So you got to destroy that, start something new. And when we first started, I was the only one who was giving them because nobody else knew how to give them because I'd been doing stuff online. But then eventually I had resources and I had everyone else working. So we worked on it and we grew and now everybody can give online workshops and now we still do them because they still help meet our goals, right? Um, and so things like that. And I think with the advent of uh, ChatGPT and that kind of AI, 
it's a similar kind of situation. There are certain types of writing assignments, I think, that a lot of people were giving that were working well for them. Um, but they aren't anymore. And maybe you need to destroy some elements of the way we do assessments. And some of the, the things we need to change were things that really weren't working anyway, uh, but people didn't want to change them. We know that most of us who work in education recognize that. And, um, and we should change them because they're not good pedagogy rather than because we're afraid of AI, I think. But I think the AI gives a nudge and that's what shocks do, right? They force you to take action when, when things are happening more slowly, you may not feel like the urgency to take action. So um, that's uh, sort of where I'm at. And so I, I wanna give you time to just take a look at this and maybe, I mean, maybe we can use time to do questions and answers if you prefer. Um, or you could go to breakout rooms and sort of discuss this, but sometimes this is one of those things where you may be work in your own context. And so everybody's gonna have a different eco cycle. But if you wanted to just take a screenshot of this or draw one for yourself and think about what is it in your practice right now that's working for you, helps meet the goals, no problem. But is there something in your practice that no longer helps you meet your goals because of anything that's changed? Even the person, there was someone who has a similar situation to me where, you know, a person who is a leader in your institution or administrator that you admire or you respect is leaving. What's going to change? You know, what needs to change? Are there certain things that we're winning just because, just because of momentum? Do, they, do we need to destroy some of these and make room for other things? Are there good ideas you've had for a long time that are even more important right now um, that just don't have enough resources? How are you going to free up resources for them? So you can birth the new ideas and help them grow into maturity. So I think I'll move on uh, rather than give you time to do that so that we can have more time for discussion. Um, and so what I'll say now is tell me in the chat what was a key takeaway for you today. And then I'll open up for questions and answers. Okay, eco cycle model, open extends well beyond our resources of the classroom. AI for cake metaphor. Yeah. Try asking people what their metaphor for AI is in general. You'll get some really interesting answers. We're writing a paper about that, actually. The equity care matrix. Yeah. Idea of open as a human practice rather than publishing economic, et cetera. Been thinking about destruction cycle, spending less time on sporting stage, on stage type events. Yes. Getting to know our open communities. Sometimes need to get old ways to open opportunities for new ones. Take metaphor, equity care matrix and code cycle, especially as it relates to things really. Yeah, pandemic, but now need to be revisited for sure. Cycle model caring, sharing half finished thoughts. Yes, get input. Eco cycle. You've been doing it. All right. Awesome. Didn't have a name for it. Awesome. Yeah. My boss likes to just go with start, stop, continue, which when I used to work at Procter & Gamble, they taught us that and start, stop, continue. Like, yeah, what do you need to start doing? What do you need to stop doing and continue doing? But I like the metaphor with the eco-cycle more. Open as a process and practice, cake metaphor. Oh, I'm glad people like the cake metaphor. I used it for another keynote recently. Like I actually gave people the answers as well that people gave, which were awesome. All right, I love that the eco cycle is going to help you with strategic planning, Lisa. That's great, Lisa or Liza. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, thinking about work as a practice rather than a thing I do for a salary or check boxes. Thought of this before. Or separated, separated. Okay, thanks for pulling you back in. Glad. So your boss owes me, right, <laughs> Carrie? Uh, appreciate a chance to reflect and get some ideas to help renew my practice. Eco cycle. Awesome. You tend to avoid destruction. It's hard. That's why they say the heretic is the one who does that. It's the hardest thing, right? To say, oh, I'm going to pull the plug on this. And if it's something that's yours, it's very difficult to, to pull the plug on it. Yeah. So plowing feels better. It feels like renewal rather than like complete destruction. Awesome. 
Okay. A lot to chew on. I'm gonna do it. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just gonna share my contact information here again. And the slides are here again. Yeah. Yeah, some people are still afraid of it. Uh, some people don't have the personal learning network, I think. When you've built this personal learning network over time, it protects you a little bit and you also know who's gonna respond when you post things or you know you have a community who's gonna respond. Um, and when they haven't been building that, it takes time to build it, right? It's not just something you get on Twitter and now suddenly people will talk to you, right? Um, Laura, garden work helps you plan, pulling everything in the fall, winter, then turning over the dirt in the spring plant again. Nice. Um, Adrienne, so many things equity that care. It's a major concept. Yeah, students can learn what to say without experience, why they're saying it. Yes, that makes a lot of sense, Adrienne, for sure. They say the right things, but they don't understand what they're saying, so they don't practice it, right? Could use gardening metaphor for eco cycle. Yeah, need to clear last year's dead plants to make room for new growth. Yeah. What I think is also very interesting that I've noticed. Um, because I take pictures of plants a lot, is that a lot of times you have death and life right next to each other. So you have the same plant with dead parts and new parts and the way roses grow and you have like the budding one and the one that's almost open and the one that's completely open and the one that's dead. Uh, it's so beautiful when all of them are alive at the same time and open, but a lot of times they're in different stages, even within the same actual branch, right? Or whatever it's called. I don't know how you call them. That's also interesting. Okay, so I put a link to if you want to give feedback on today uh, to me, and um, that's it. And these slides are uh, sort of from Slide Carnival, but I messed them up after I take the template if you wanted to try something. Else. Okay, we have nine minutes for questions. If you want to ask any questions? Um, Maha, would you prefer that people uh, like raise their hand virtually and then? You know, ask their question over Zoom, or would you prefer them to use the chat? Whatever they want to do. Okay, thank you. So I usually do like Mentimeter for Q&A so that people can upvote questions, but we have time. I can take a few. I think I can take a few. What do I find, find most challenging about AI? Yeah, I think it's the most challenging thing about AI as an educational developer who you know, helps people deal with it. I said, every single person has a completely different situation. So just because someone teaches writing doesn't mean that the advice that I give them will be the same as the next person because someone else teaches writing at the senior level where they can benefit from adding AI and the students already know how to write uh, or someone who's teaching at the, you know, freshman level where students don't know how to write. The students I have in my institution, they come from very different educational backgrounds. So some of them have even if they're at the same writing level, they have different levels of fluency in English, they have different levels of digital literacies. So when you say, I'm gonna allow them to use it, some of them don't know how to use it very well and who's gonna teach the students how to do that? So I think the most challenging thing is that nobody really knows and everybody's context is quite different and their teaching philosophy is different. And so trying to, to, to tell people, experiment with it and have grace for yourself this semester as you try and take your time in the summer to learn more about it, but they're also very burnt out coming out of COVID and having to learn how to teach online and then having to learn how to teach hybrid and then having to learn to teach with masks. And now this AI thing, I'm like, really? Can we just stop learning new pedagogies for a semester of our lives? So it's about trying to be caring about that. And at the same time, be gentle with students and trying to explain to people, try not to be focused on catching students doing AI and try to focus on, but also asking people to change their assessments every semester is, is a lot. I mean, they, I mean, I think it's good to do that, but we need to recognize that it's a lot of effective labor that some professors will do and some professors will not. And the students are going to bear the brunt of that, you know, that our different capacities for imagination and our different capacities to actually reinvent ourselves all the time in these shocks. So thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to pray. Okay. I've still got about five minutes here. Okay. My daughter wants a hug, I think. You want a hug? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I got you. Okay. okay. Chrissy's saying, what advice do I have for faculty that might be just getting started with open, frustrated with the initial search process for resources? How can we encourage further exploration and development? Wow. Um, so here's something I actually wrote about this. And I think the most useful thing is 
finding a community to ask questions to and help out with. So if you know this person, <clears throat> what I've done before is someone needs help with something that I'm not an expert in necessarily. And I would get on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever social media they're using and tag some people that I think might help them outside of my institution who I know are responsive. And that shows them immediately, oh, by the way, when you build a personal learning network, this is what can happen. And, and help them through the process of whatever the platform that they might be using um, is how does that platform work? Like helping them figure out how do you grow your network there so that you can find your people. And obviously they, like if you're a librarian or a faculty developer like myself, your people are gonna be different than their people. Um, so figure out who from your people might know the kinds of people they might need. I think that can help a lot. Um, but they, I think they need to know that it's gonna take a while. Uh, is the other thing, right? And that once you reach a certain threshold of knowing enough people, cataloging people, <laughs> that's funny. Okay, you're a librarian, aren't you? You said that, I'm guessing. I'm, I'm, I'm cataloging you into a librarian books, yeah. <laughs> um, and that helps. Yeah, I think that might help. Um, if you have a community and do something like a learning community where all the people who are in that space are, are learning together within your institution or within your networks, that can help as well. Oh, cool. That's nice, Heather. Thank you. Okay. Anyone want to ask a question out loud? Or I'll take anything else in the chat obviously, as well. I'll take one. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. So how do you deal with like outright hostility to the notion of using such resources and opening up one's classroom? Um, I, I don't think I get that much hostility. I get hostility sometimes on the open, but not so much. Um, so tell me more about the kind of hostility. I mean, I, I get hostility, but it's not, that doesn't usually bother me. <laughs> so well, tell me more about the kind of hostility you mean. I am in law and many of the faculty are pretty old fashioned. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's, they are gradually retiring, <laughs> which helps. But then there are other folks that are just, this is the way we learned. This is yeah. the way we have to teach for you yeah. to pass the bar, you know, and yeah. so they're teaching for this other purpose as opposed to yeah. actual yeah. teaching yeah. them legal reasoning and thinking. Right. So th there are several dimensions to this really complicated question. And I think one of them is, first of all, to just recognize that everyone's pathway to openness is going to be different. I mean, the reason I got into openness was funny because I was I had a baby and my, comp my country was in revolution and I was trying to finish my PhD and I couldn't access all the library resources I needed. And I discovered that pirated stuff on the Internet was helping me get book chapters for books that cost like five hundred dollars that I couldn't afford to buy. Uh, so I got into openness through piracy. And I was so thankful that people were doing that. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna share as much as I can to the world. And another uh, direction that got me into openness is because I struggled to read certain things during my PhD. I decided that when I write, my writing is gonna be accessible. And I, when I was writing my thesis, my supervisors kept making me write it more formally. And that's why I got into blogging where I don't write formally, but even my peer reviewed papers, if you ever read them, they should be very accessible and not very formal in the way they're written. So these are the ways I got into open. Different people get into it through different ways. There's an element of vulnerability in opening up your classroom or working with someone else where, oh my God, someone's gonna know what I'm, what I'm doing in my class. They're gonna see everything I do wrong or they're gonna judge me. And I, I, even like when I go into uh, uh, someone's class to observe them even just to support them because I'm there to help them not, to, not for their promotion or tenure or anything. Even when they're my friends, they get nervous. So people get nervous letting people in. And some people are generally more open in their lives and they're willing to share than others, just like in any context, right? I used to work at Rice University teaching English and we were meant to share uh, our slides and our exams and everything with each other. And for some people, this is easy. And for other people, it's just harder. So there's that element of just personality and there's an element of privilege. First of all, sometimes someone is trying to protect their privilege. So the older people who have been doing this forever, they want to protect their privilege. They don't want anyone else to know what they're, they don't want to give someone else what they're teaching because they think, oh, well now I'm not, they're going to let me go and bring an adjunct to teach my course or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. With my materials. Um, the problem is we are not our materials. 
there's so much more we bring to a classroom that is never going to be open because there are relationships one on one with our students and the kind of ways we facilitate learning and nobody can take that away from us. I think the content is not the, the biggest deal right like knowledge should be to me shared but it's not the way everyone feels um, here in Egypt, for example. Uh, the professors outside of my institution, because my institution is American and very similar to what you probably have. But in other institutions, the teachers, they don't get paid very well, the university professors, but they create materials that they sell and they make money out of the materials they sell and by giving private lessons and things like that. So if they give away their materials, then they lose that. That's an income source for them that they need on top of, you know, so there are different reasons people do that. Sometimes when people are new, they're, they've been indoctrinated into the system of academia that's closed and capitalistic and, and neoliberal and all of that. So they're just doing what they've been told is how you succeed. And it takes a while to change that. Um, but I think if we keep sharing how we're learning this way, bring them into open spaces we're in where they might learn. So let them benefit from openness before we ask them to contribute to openness. And I think a lot of people, when they take a lot, eventually they'll give back. And we don't need every single person. Adrienne Marie Brown says it's not about. Um, the e equality of giving in real time and reciprocity. It's about give when you can give, ask for help when you need it, and the universe will work itself out, I think. And that's how generosity, I think, works in, in openness. Yeah. That's a good ending to the session. <laughs> that is. That's a, a good, a perfect time to end. Um, Maha, thank you so much. If we can all give her a, a virtual round of applause. Thank you. Uh, Please pray to the traffic people. angels to help me get to the wedding in time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We will. Yeah. Um, so uh, for the rest of you, uh, a reminder that you can you can keep keep conversing on Discord, um, or you can tweet at Maha or um, contact her. Use her feedback link. Um, I'll share the links that we kind of collected in the chat under the Discord. We're going to take a 29 minute break. Um, our next session is at 1.30, and it is the Open Pedagogy panel with Melanie Gagic, Shelly Rose, Kathy Kernow, Yang Wu, Vanya Dapali, and Leah Holcomb. Um, again, that's at 1.30 p.m., and it's the same Zoom link that you're using now.